Are we ready? Good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, Thursday, June 15th, uh, middle of June already, 2023. Um, wow, the sun starts going the other way in six days. Not good. Uh, this is a special meeting of the Atlanta Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Uh, this is a continuation of a conversation we started uh, at our last meeting on a Thursday morning. Uh, I thought a particularly thoughtful discussion amongst uh, the commissioners uh, about this uh, issue of whether or not to uh, authorize the issuance of a resolution that we would send on to the um, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency in support of a potential, and I use the word potential, possible uh, affordable housing project on the west side of town off 169 and Bren Road. So uh, we didn't, uh, we got to the point where we thought, well, let's potentially modify the language of the resolution, bring it back for some further discussion, and, and we're going to do that uh, today uh, at this special meeting. And that's the sole purpose of this special meeting. Just a reminder, as Director Benarot told you, this is not a, this is not a public hearing. It's a public meeting, but it's not a public hearing. We're not taking any public testimony on this issue that this commission is going to address today. Uh, but if you have something else you want to talk to us about that's not on today's agenda or scheduled for a future public hearing, feel free to do so. And it has been our practice since during the time of COVID. Um, we used to measure things A, D, B, C. Now we got pre-COVID, post-COVID uh, to add into the mix. Um, uh, if you're watching on cable TV uh, or at edinamn.gov live meetings or on Facebook, uh, here's a number you can call in for community comment. Uh, you'll have three minutes to talk to the uh, HRA about a matter of concern to you. Uh, and our executive director, also our city manager, Scott Neal, will uh, address any issues that came up at our prior meeting. Uh, and uh, having provided that information, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask uh, Sharon Allison, our clerk, to call the roll for the HRA, and then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Agnew? Here. Commissioner Jackson? Here. Commissioner Pierce? Here. Commissioner Risser? Here. Chair Hovland? Here. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, we've got a form of meeting agenda in front of us this afternoon for the HRA. Is there anyone uh, on the commission or uh, the man, man, on staff on a staff level that wishes to modify the agenda in any form or No, there's not. All right, okay. Is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Commissioner Jackson, second by Commissioner Agnew to approve the meeting agenda. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the meeting agenda shown say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we're back at community comment, folks. We talked about this, uh, both Director Benarot and I have addressed this issue. If there's, and we'll go to the audience first. So if there's anyone in the audience that wishes to address the council, uh, or the council, the commission on a matter of concern to them, uh, please come forward. You know, it can't be on the agenda today or scheduled for a future public hearing. All right, not seeing anybody coming forward. Uh, anybody on the line that wishes to address the HRA on a matter of concern to them that uh, would be community comment related? I do not have any callers at this time. As you might recall, there is a slight delay in the broadcast. Because it has not yet been a minute since we started community comment, I would recommend we wait before moving on. My clock shows that it's 4.06. I'll come back to you at 4.07 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. Good. Thank you.
has been one minute and I still don't have a caller, so I think it's safe for you to move forward with the agenda. Okay, thank you. I was listening to that uh, chime. I was just ready to launch into some kind of a hymn. I <laughs> thought we should all be singing. All right, um, well, so we've got uh, one uh, business matter in front of us this uh, afternoon that's a continuation of uh, conversation. As I mentioned, we started in the HRA. Uh, before we get to that, I'm going to check with our executive director to see if he had any response to committee comments from the prior uh, HRA meeting. We did not have any. We did not have any comments at our previous HRA meeting. All right. Thank you, and thanks for asking. Um, I thought I remembered that we didn't have any, and I jumped right past it on the agenda. So we've got a potential resolution in front of us, uh, 202305, that would. Uh, be supportive, uh, at least in a theoretical way, of uh, uh, potentially having affordable housing at 5780 Lincoln Drive. Uh, it's something that's required by the Minnesota Housing Finance Authority to um, be able to potentially advance uh, funding requests by, on the part of the developer. And they need to know that the, the city has some at least theoretical potential possible support for the project before uh, really uh, we've learned uh, the um, Minnesota Housing Finance will really even entertain an application from a developer because there's so many of them throughout the state of Minnesota. So Stephanie Hawkinson, our affordable housing development manager is gonna give a brief introduction to the resolution and kind of give us a summary of the conversation we had uh, last Thursday and then we're going to uh, have a conversation about this and I've. I'll make some uh, introductory uh, remarks uh, before we get into the substance of the conversation. Uh, I think that'll, that'll help us uh, with, from a guidance standpoint. So Ms. Hawkinson, go ahead, Manager Hawkinson. Thank you, good afternoon. So as stated, today I'm seeking approval of resolution 2023-05, supporting affordable housing at 5780 Lincoln. As discussed last week, this resolution is to accompany an application to Minnesota Housing in order to leverage financial support and an allocation of tax credits. Minnesota Housing is clear on their requirements. The resolution as amended will not rise to their defined level of commitment as conveyed in the staff report and therefore will not be accepted by them. I acknowledge the timing is not ideal. As staff, I brought this before you at this time, not only because of the timing of our funding partners' application cycles, but as it is consistent with the timing of previous resolutions of support for 100% affordable housing developments. As staff, we use our technical expertise to evaluate proposals based on previously approved processes and guided plans as approved by the City Council and HRA. In this case, the proposed development complies with the guided land use in the comprehensive plan for a residential dwelling of between 25 to 75 units per acre, the transportation plan to create affordable options near transit corridors, as this is one of the few locations in this area of town that is within a quarter mile of a transit service, and with a climate action plan calling for increasing density in existing development land to reduce carbon community-wide emissions per household. The proposal was also brought forth based on public comment regarding the concentration of affordable housing feeding into the Cornelia Elementary School. This is one of the few sites outside the southeast quadrant of the city that is guided for multifamily housing. There's also community pushback about placing affordable housing here and in the Cahill District. Although the land use decision does not need to be decided today, but rather by the City Council at a future date, if it is determined that multifamily affordable rental developments are not appropriate at this location, as affordable housing development manager, I will need your guidance on where multifamily affordable rental developments can be located. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawkinson. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Ocker to come up. I see her sitting in the audience. Um, I just want to do a follow-on with our planning staff uh, regarding uh, this, how the site is guided, and Emily Boddicker has come up to, to assist. Um, I think it might be worthwhile having a little backgrounding in terms of the underlying zoning, how it's guided. And then uh, with respect to the potential use of PUD, which has been recommended here, uh, why would we think about PUD and how did, how did PUD come into existence in the first place? So those are the, the three areas I think that might give us a little historical uh, framework for our conversation. Sure, so um, the property is guided 
office residential in the comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan is the guiding document for the city when um, there is zo a zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan um, is, if there is a difference between the two, the comprehensive plan wins given the city is obligated to zone in accordance with the plan. So currently the property is zoned PID, it always has been. But in 2008, it was decided that uh, when they were going through the whole comprehensive plan uh, process that it would be reguided office residential. And when a property is rezoned, um, that's when you bring it into compliance with the comprehensive plan uh, with an underlying zoning district that would support that. Um, so back in 2008, there was uh, a policy where we do a give to get. So if you're going to, um, uh, both the city as well as the developer would have to give to get certain um, uh, opportunities for the property. Um, and then that eventually turned into a PUD process where uh, the city can have flexibility in the zoning. Um, beyond with just what it's currently zoned at. Um, it allows the city and the developer to achieve a more desirable or beneficial outcome for both parties. It also allows, I believe, for uh, affordable housing to stay affordable longer because the city has the opportunity then to uh, put conditions on the PUD. Does that give you some information on that? All right. Ms. Boddicker, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, there's... All right. Sorry. Oh, sorry. The PUD allows for more flexibility, so for the developer and for the city to be more flexible, um, ultimately that decision would be made by city council with um, how that PUD is written. Okay. And the underlying zoning was industrial? Correct. Okay. PID, plan industrial. So if, if the city council, at some point in the future, after hearing public testimony on both sides of the issue determined that this was an appropriate location for affordable housing, uh, that underlying zoning would be changed. It'd be a PUD sort of process that would be approved here. But the comprehensive plan would not require any amendment because of the way the property is guided right now as commercial residential or office residential. Correct. An office residential doesn't mean you have to have a combination of an office and a residence in the same building. It just means it could be, could be used for either purpose. Correct. Okay. All right. Member Risser. Um, could you please go back to the slide that defines office residential? Thank you. Um, if we look at the verbiage, the final sentence um, for description and land uses, it says vertical mixed use should be encouraged and may be required on larger sites. Um, have we defined what a larger site would be? What constitutes a larger site? In that land use district, no. Okay. Um, can we now go to the zoning map that was just up? Okay. Uh, one of the concerns that was raised is the lack of access to, you know, commercial spaces, stores, um, conveniences for residents who live there. Um, another concern that was brought up, and I do believe we need affordable housing throughout Edina, okay? And I do think it would make sense to have affordable housing here. Uh, that being noted, the way we go about it is so important. And we in Edina have been building, approving uh, purely residential projects. Um, and not just on land where it is a permitted use, but on land where it isn't. And if you look to the south, that red color represents the um, little strip mall that is there. And if you look over at the Wooddale Valley View Road area, you see a lot of red, okay? And that is also the PCD1 zoning. We now have three purely residential projects that have been built on the PCD1 zoning. And even though our code says that you cannot have commercial use on the first floor or the basement, we have allowed that to happen. And as I look at Edina and where we're headed, one of my major concerns is that 
we are continuing to add purely residential and where are we going to get walkability? We're sort of dialing that back um, and you know, looking, listening to the planning commission, it seemed very clear that a lot of people thought, oh, it'd be great if there could be something in that space. So as we move to our future land use, um, and actually, if we could go to that, thank you. Uh, this has come up in other cases as well, where the implication is that there's going to be a mixed use. This happened with the mixed use center. And you know, I'm actually kind of confused. This is a aside, but City Hall is mixed use center instead of government, which seems weird. But um, we, I think, need to do something to really encourage um, development so that it can be more viable for people who are living in affordable dwellings so that it's possible. And I think about Cahill and that little market there, which is so fantastic because you can get you know, dried beans, you can get samosas, you can get all kinds of things. And uh, just being able to have that kind of walkability is important, um, but it's important for all of Edina. Uh, you know, now we have walkability as one of the indexes that is attached to residential property. So I wanna put that out there. Um, I think what we need is careful planning and mindful planning. Um, also, it came up that this area of Edina has not had a neighborhood study yet, and it would be good if that could be something that would come out of that. I am heartened, though, that with the material that was presented, um, I see that the developer is asking for 89 units on the site, and so it is a straightforward ask for that. It is no longer the up to 141, and I think that does provide opportunity to maybe push the building away from London Dairy and the highway because there'll be more space and also to create a building that is not five stories but maybe four stories or three stories. So um, it's, it's um, good to see that. All right, I don't think by any of these comments you should take it to, to you sh anyone in this room or listening in should take it or should understand that people are prejudging this matter because it has to go through a defined process with the city council. So um, I, one further question I think for both uh, Ms. Hawkinson as the affordable housing manager and for you as our planning staff, is that is our understanding correct that you support this location as a potential site for affordable housing? From a zoning standpoint or from a um, comprehensive land use plan standpoint, yes. From a land use standpoint, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's your specialty. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Hawkinson, is that my understanding? Yes. Correct? All right. Okay. So I, I think uh, we just heard from Commissioner Risser, and Commissioner Risser raised a, a question I think that is probably, uh, this is at our Thursday meeting when we had this, I thought, a good conversation. And incidentally, there were, there were several people from the neighborhood here, and I expected to see after the fact some emails circulating about the, the, the kind of content-rich conversation that took place here around this issue of this misalignment between what Minnesota Housing Finance does, in other words, taking applications and deciding on them once a year whether they're going to provide money, and, and what we're doing from a city standpoint in terms of our processes. And I think that's a conversation we can have with them. But uh, the issue raised by Ms. Risser about, uh, remember, Commissioner Risser uh, last meeting about uh, zoning and uh, how it's guided a use of this site, it seemed to me that before we even get into a conversation about uh, whether or not we should adopt this resolution, we should have a conversation as a, as a predicate matter about whether uh, commissioners, the majority of the commissioners, think that this is a site or they view this site as a potential site for affordable housing as an HRA commissioner. And if we can't answer that question in the, from a majority standpoint, why bother talking about a resolution? So this is the reason I thought it would be important to have this sort of land use discussion first so that we could have the conversation amongst us uh, on that preliminary question of whether or not this site is viewed by a majority of us as a potential possible site for affordable housing uh, by the HRA members and, and also us eventually sitting as city council members. So I don't know if anybody cares to 
lead off that portion of the conversation, but I think that's important. And, and before we start, incidentally, I want to say that we've gotten uh, dozens and dozens of emails on, on both sides of this issue acknowledging probably that the neighbors in Parkwood Knowles generally don't like the notion of it. A, a minority of the folks in Parkwood Knowles like the notion of it. We've got other folks uh, in the broader community that like the notion of it. Uh, but this process that we're engaged in today has nothing in, uh, to do with whether or not this project gets eventually uh, approved or not approved. Uh, we're here today to decide whether or not we're going to comply with what we need to do with respect to Minnesota housing finance. And I want to thank everybody that sent in an email, whether you were for it or against it, for the sort of the high level of thought that went into the emails. I know there were some emails that there were a couple of them that a lot of people adopted one version or another, but they were both very uh, well done, uh, articulately expressed uh, their concerns about this project. Um, not necessarily premature because it's all educational. Um, <clears throat> and I'll address this issue at maybe at, at the city council meeting we have on the 20th, but uh, as I said, everybody that sent in an email on this uh, particular matter, I thought was taking the high road. We've had some people, and I meant to address this at our last city council meeting, we've had some people in our community that write in, and you think about the art of persuasion, uh, when you're trying to convince us that your voice matters and a voice should be heard, and we believe that as a basic democratic principle, that all voices matter and all voices should be heard. But when you personally attack our staff uh, with vitriol, we're not, you know, your, your, your voice for me uh, is immediately excluded from the conversation. And so for those people out there that think they could say something in writing that they wouldn't ever say to somebody's face, and get by with it. You're not getting by with it with us. You're not getting by with it with me. And I think many of my colleagues feel the same way. And this isn't to cast any aspersions on anybody that sent an email in on this particular matter because they were all taking the high road, as I said. But just for the broader community, I would say, take the high road. Don't attack our staff on things that you don't like. Uh, they're here to do a job, and they do their job very effectively. So. Um, Let's get back to the conversation at hand, and that is whether or not we think, a majority of us think that this site is a potential site for affordable housing. Anybody care to lead off on their thoughts? Commissioner Pierce? Thanks. Oh, sure. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I do uh, believe that this is a good site for affordable housing. Um, or for the, one of the things that I, that I wanted to say, and I'm glad you led into it, the emails um, that we received, I kind of felt like I was in a debate I didn't know I was in. Um, and it was, you know, emails saying you should support affordable housing, um, you should honor the neighborhood, the look and feel of the neighborhood, kind of, and, and like, I'm not in a debate with either of those positions. Um, I think everybody up here agrees that we need to have affordable housing. This is about uh, what is the right process. Um, where I kind of got tripped up is, is this the right project for affordable housing in that location? Um, and so that was, for me, where I, I got tripped up. But to your question of um, do I believe this is a, a, um, a good location for affordable housing, um, I do. Um, for many other reasons that were raised earlier, um, the least of which is just you know, the walkability, the access. Um, and so that would be my comments on that specific question. All right. Commissioner Jackson and Commissioner Brisser. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I echo, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who wrote in. It really was a high quality um, conversation. Everybody had something interesting to say and something useful to say. And I think that's kind of what's been driving my thoughts on this. So I do believe that this would be a potential good site for affordable housing, but I want to stress that I really, really want to hear the public on this. I think my driving um, sentiment is that I want to have a public hearing so that everybody can hear each other. The problem with email is we can hear you, but you can't hear each other. And it's very important to me that both the neighbors 
who are for, the neighbors who are against, the community members who are for, the community members who are against can hear each other. I think that that's uh, the overwhelming value that I have for this. Um, I do think this is a good site for affordable housing. Um, it's a good site for a lot of things, um, and I want to hear a, a robust conversation about it. Um, so I think that answers my question. All right, thank you. Commissioner Risser and Commissioner Agnew. Um, and I, I do want to thank the Edina resident who wrote in to say it, that he was frustrated that we didn't have the appropriate hat on or appear to know which hat we were wearing. And I took that to heart. Uh, one thing I think that threw me for a loop was we had the city council meeting at which the sketch plan was introduced and we were told it was truly very schematic and that the developer was very open about what we want to do there and wanted to get feedback. And um, Member Pierce introduced an idea of, you know, row houses or townhomes, excuse me. And um, I had, about a month ago, I was able to visit Greendale, which is one of the Greenbelt um, housing developments from the 1930s. And I don't know if any of you have seen those, but it's so amazing because they were created for people, you know, workforce housing, but they shared green space so you could have a garden and everything. And so uh, Member Pierce brought that up and I go home and I'm Googling all of this and I'm thinking, oh, how great, you know, and then less than 48 hours later, uh, it became very clear that that sketch plan really was kind of carved in stone. And um, it was really hard. It was a, a back and forth that was sort of still challenging for me right now, but really understanding my role here is very different from my role on council. And I thank the resident for bringing that up. I take it to heart. And to the question that I raised, um, how do you answer that? I support affordable housing on this site. And yeah, I, I thought I made that clear in the beginning yeah. when I, I was talking about the general right. area. Um, I do think we do have tremendous opportunity if we were to do a neighborhood study and really think about, you know, what could this area be, you know, because it could be, you know, you think about, you kind of dream big and you think about how you have the Chamber of Commerce and the Innovation Lab and you've got the bike trail and you could have, you know, maybe a space that was a business innovation business place near a development and it could just be really very exciting. Thank you, Member Commissioner Risser. Commissioner Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's estimated that the U.S. housing market is short 6.5 million homes, and that's a figure from this year, 2023. Um, in Edina alone, we've committed to, what is it, over 1,800 units by 2030 of affordable housing, right? The 6.5 million is housing in general. Um, housing shortages lead to increased prices of housing, which is what, you know, really eliminates affordability in the market. And so when I look across the city of Edina, I, I think that there are, we need to really think critically about a lot of areas that we need to in, infuse more affordable housing in. And because of that, I think that this location is, is really a great opportunity to do that. So yes, I support that on this site. Okay. Um, I like those data points. I know that in the meetings I've attended um, in the Metro uh, they're talking about the fact that we're 18,000 housing units short. Really, we really fell short during the time of COVID when everything kind of ground to a halt. But uh, despite our slow growth uh, in the metro, that's still the housing challenge. Uh, so from a theoretical standpoint, from a potentiality standpoint, uh, I think uh, we need to look at whether this site makes sense for affordable housing as well. So it seems like we've got un unanimity of opinion on that. So then the next question would be, um, you heard Manager Hawkinson talk about the fact that she didn't like those edits that I did <laughs> to try to soften things up a little sure. bit. Uh, um, and I, and I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but I know you're, you're trying to guide us with respect to Minnesota housing finance and what they'll take as uh, support. Them understanding over at Minnesota housing finance that we have a we have a process to go through here that involves a lot of public input we, before we decide whether this even works. You know, we like it from a potentiality standpoint or a hypothetical standpoint, but we we may never get to a project that we like or that works out quite right for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, you want to comment on the resolution? 
Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, Minnesota Housing is very clear that they will not take words such as, if you go to the second page, the first whereas, potential local confirmation may assist. They will not accept words such as potential and may. Um, and the first, be it further resolved, um, the may potentially provide, they will not accept this resolution with the, that kind of verbiage in it. But what um, helps is in here also is that the this is null and void if they do not get site plan approval. This resolution is contingent upon them getting site plan approval. So the language in the resolution needs to be stronger, um, but without the mays and the possibles and the other type of soft contingent language, because it is contingent on site plan approval, that is okay to include. I'm also concerned about the last whereas. Um, this is not a tested process, and I don't know what unintended consequences are, and I don't know if we should test it on affordable housing development that works on a very thin margin when we've had um, market rate developments go through that this has not been a criteria. All right, let me turn to Commissioner Jackson, who suggested the uh, interlineation of that language. Commissioner Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to pass this out. This is a, um, a rewording of uh, both the whereas clause and then uh, the um, operative language. This gets it in line with, um, with the intent, which is that this is a, an agreement between the developer and the Building uh, Dignity and Respect Council, so that this would not be enforced by the city. But I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, Wage theft and misclassification of workers, avoidance of workers' compensation, um, and unsafe working conditions are a problem throughout the um, state of Minnesota. And this is, there have been a number of high profile cases. One of the ways in which affordable housing does lower the cost is through unfair labor practices. And um, you may have remembered there was about, oh, nine months ago or so, a big story about one of the Vikings training facilities uh, where there was uh, misuse of workers. Um, and it, it's dangerous. People, construction is dangerous business, and if you don't have workers' compensation, if you are classified as an independent contractor, you don't get workers' compensation. You get injured on the job, you're done. You don't get your hospital bills paid for by your employer. You have to go to work injured, or maybe you can't work at all after that. So this is a very serious problem. It's throughout many industries, but especially in the construction industry, and especially in affordable housing. So I had a conversation um, yesterday with a gentleman who said, you know, I represent workers who are on the lower end of the pay scale, and they need this housing. But it's really disturbing that it's built on the backs of the most uh, vulnerable workers, the marginalized workers. And um, so this is a problem that, that we've seen throughout the country, but here in Minnesota, which is a human rights state, is really upsetting. We have laws in the books for criminal and civil liability for violations of workers' rights and worker safety issues, but they can't be enforced if there are no complaints registered. And that's the problem. The bad employers intimidate workers. The story I heard was a gentleman was in the hospital um, for a routine procedure with his wife, and a man comes in splattered in blood. He says, I have a construction worker in my van. He put a uh, um, nail gun, shot a nail through his leg. He won't get out of the van because he's afraid if he comes to the hospital, he will lose his job and he's been threatened with physical violence for reporting unsafe work conditions, both against him and his family. So this is a pretty serious problem. It's very serious and, and people's lives and safety and, and well-being are at risk. Um, so I've been studying this for about two years now and the big thing was we didn't have a tool to address this, especially as cities. What can we do? Well, there are laws in the books. How do you get people to come forward? So this is a new tool. I admit it is a new tool. Um, it was created in 2022. And um, the thing that blocks complaints being registered are two things, ignorance and worker intimidation. And so this program educates workers so that they know their rights, what it is to have a safe and, and 
effective workplace. And second, they provide a third party mediator to receive and review complaints and work with contractors to remedy the situation. This is not requiring staff to go, city staff to go in. This is a third party mediator. Um, it's not a union recruitment tool. I've heard, well, this is all about recruiting new members of the union. This is an independent nonprofit that runs this. They're funded with um, grants from McKnight and from uh, the Minneapolis Foundation. It's not a union um, shop. It's not about union recru recruitment. Um, it's a new program. It was created um, with, uh, <coughs> based on work done with dairy workers in Vermont and with ag workers in Florida. Uh, these programs in Vermont and Florida have successfully raised the working conditions of workers in those states, uh, especially in the agricultural area. So it, it is proven, just not in Minnesota and just not in this particular situation, but it's, it's a program that's been used worldwide, but adopted in these two areas. So yes, we would be the first city to require this, Minnesota, this program, um, the first city in Minnesota to do so. But you know what, Edina likes to be a leader. We like to be groundbreakers. This is a groundbreaking moment for human rights in our state. Um, it was brought to me by a, an Edina resident, and I'm really excited about the opportunity of um, protecting workers here in our city. And I think that one of the things we ask the developer to do is to be innovative. And this is an innovative program. It's something that um, I think Minnesota Housing Finance Authority would have Appreciate. We got a letter from um, Attorney General Keith Ellison today supporting this, asking us to adopt it. And um, I think we should ensure that affordable housing in Edina is not built at the expense of marginalized workers. And that's why I bring this forward. So to that, I did hand out, this is again some rewording of the language um, in the resolution. It, I will read it. Oh, here, you can yeah, see it well, on the, can the see public it, can I, see can it. Can I ask you a question? Sure, uh, on, the, of course. on the second page on the second whereas clause, mm -hmm. was that one that was in there before or is that one that you've recommended be inserted? I recommended it last Thursday, so it's in here. Um, it was written originally, whereas the developer builder has agreed as a condition of city financial support to adopt and enforce the terms of the Building yeah. Dignity and Respect okay. Code of Conduct for the project. So that was in what the public saw. This is just a rewording to show that it's an agreement okay. between the developer and uh, this council, sure. uh, as opposed to we don't have to enforce it. Um, was this the language you were concerned about? before Commissioner Jackson passed off her uh, second recommendation? Yes, I, I was concerned about it. And I, I fully agree with the overall generalized concerns, and I do believe it is an issue. Um, the city hasn't adopted a policy yet regarding that issue, which I, you know, and my role is to follow pre-adopted policies. Um, I, I, um, I don't know definitively whether or not this will be an added cost. When I had met with them, um, there was this unmitigated um, access to construction sites. I don't know what the legal and code parameters are around having people have ready access to construction sites. Um, that isn't governed by general contractors. I don't know, you know, with hard hats and OSHA and all that, on um, what what all rules pertain to that. I think that it's just unknown whether or not there are added costs. There was one concern that um, of shutting down job sites if they w there was concern that um, there was some labor issues that were going on. I'd also like to add as a as an affordable housing development that's different than market rate developments is because of the MHFI financing. They have to comply with um, wage um, requirements using um, I'm, I'm prevailing wage. Prevailing wage. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, they have to use prevailing wage, and it does get closely monitored um, by the state that they are. They have a lot of reporting that they have to do that prevailing wage is being met, and that is being monitored by the state. Now, that does not happen on market rate developments where the state would be doing monitoring on prevailing wage, and that will be happening here. So I didn't know if that could be um, a... Um, step in the direction to help address some of these very serious, very concerning um, issues that are generally out there. 
Yeah, first of all, I want to make sure that it's, it's not something that we are concerned about relative to this particular developer. I mean, this is not targeted at the developer in this particular, proposed developer in this particular circumstance. Well, because that's going to affect my. Uh, I will well, tell my, you, there's a there's a company called Painting America, which is currently working at the Fred One, and this is a company that was found by the Department of Labor to have misclassified workers as uh, independent contractors. So they're a subcontractor. They're a subcontractor, and what this does is it links all the way. The first thing is they go to the subcontractor, and if the subcontractor doesn't comply, then they go to the contractor. And if the contractor doesn't apply, this allows them to then go to the developer. So this is a, a process that is they try and resolve at the, the very basic level, but there's a, a level you can keep escalating um, to, to get to the point where workers are safe. Here, yeah. uh, Commissioner yeah, Pierce, go ahead. I, I've got a couple of thoughts, but I'll, I'll save them. Go um, ahead, Commissioner just, Pierce. And so I definitely support where you're going, Commissioner Jackson. I feel like we're making this matter more complicated. And so um, if I can just be selfish in front of 60 of my, my, my neighbors, the issue I have with this is it says it's supporting affordable housing at 5780 Lincoln Drive, which we've said we agree with. But then the second whereas says, to construct a new multifamily housing project on the site that consists of approximately 89 affordable rental apartments. Right? In the sketch plan, it's five stories up, two stories underground. And so if you ask me if I would support a resolution that would assist the developer in securing financing for a project, I might be okay with that. But where I'm still challenged is this is saying I believe that, that, that I would support this developer securing financing for this project is, is how I interpret that. And so I, I thought what we were trying to do was kind of tease that apart a little bit by saying um, potential mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not approved. It still has to go through site plan. A different project could come forward, but I don't. I don't think that's the case. I, I don't think the developer could come back and say, instead of doing this project, we're going to do fifty town, fifty affordable ownership townhomes. Um, maybe that works. I don't know, but that's what I am challenged with. And then having the discussion on. Uh, that we just had further complicates to me the resolution. I don't know if there was a so, question. Should I ask? Uh, uh, I think you raise a great question there for the second whereas clause. Um, Director Hawkinson, do you think that we could uh, have that second whereas clause potentially read Solheim Companies, a developer proposes to construct a new multifamily housing project on the site for individuals? We've got to define the site. We should have that in there. Uh, for in, in, and take out that language about how many units it is. So it would say uh, it's housing project on the site for individuals and families with an average household income at or below 50% median income. Why does that? I, I, it seems to me that uh, Minnesota Housing Finance doesn't care about the number of units. Uh, that's going to be dealt with on, a, on an application basis. But in the resolution, does it really matter? To, to Commissioner Pierce's point, don't, don't they just need to know that we're supporting a potential multifamily housing project there that's affordable without getting it? Because we, they've asked for more than 89. They've got a phase one, a phase two. We, we don't know where we're going with this thing. Uh, Chair, Commissioners, um, I'm la reading the language um, regarding the resolution from Minnesota Housing, and it um, it says a, it can contain no contingencies, um, and not the words consider may or any synonyms, but it does not say that the number of units needs to be concretely defined. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the number of units or the type of construct. 
because this says 89 affordable rental apartment units. Mm -hmm. And what I talked about in council was ownership options because we have uh, throughout the community affordable apartments. And so if we're trying to focus on the entire life cycle of affordable housing, we do need ownership options. And so I was recommending, or maybe not recommending, but asking the question of the developer, um, what about affordable ownership for townhomes? And this is very specifically, it says it's 89 apartments. But Chair, Commissioner, um, that would be a problematic language in a couple of manners. One, since the site is guided 25 to 75 units per acre, you couldn't get townhomes to, you'd have to have a comprehensive plan amendment, so that would be a whole nother situation. I know that's a city council issue, but I just want to be transparent that that would be it. Um, I think affordable home ownership townhomes are not being developed because they're not financially feasible. Um, so that, that's another concern. The third concern with regards to this resolution specifically is that it's a different pocket of money. It's a different pot of money. When the Minnesota Housing um, looks at applications, they have a whole different application process for ownership, for um, ownership development, which is not this application. So this application is a multifamily, tax credit funded, apartment, rental apartment application. Thank you, that, that was the question. Yeah, thank you. But nonetheless, to Commissioner Pierce's point, thanks for that education. Uh, we could still strike out the number of units, even if we continue to refer to the fact that it's going to be rental. Commissioner Risser. Um, I just want to be totally clear because I understand with this grant application, we are, it is for a specific kind of development. And one of the things that I've been getting a lot of feedback on is the height and, you know, how close it will be to the freeway and London Dairy Road. And so when I read the staff report with the specific information that on 2.5, nine acres, we will have 89 units, I breathed a sigh of relief because that opens up so much, then phase two is not going to happen, correct? Correct. So, I mean, this is what was presented in the information accompanying the re resolution. And so I, I just wanna be crystal clear that this is what we're saying because that's, that's making it, in my mind, a project that has a much better chance of being built without having to have um, variances for height and variances for setback and all of that. So it could be more code compliant or right off the bat. If there's no phase two. If there's no phase two, because then you can just, you know, mm -hmm. move it. Yeah, yeah. So and so I said, I, yeah. and I was concurring with you because I, I think there's a way based on our conversation we had when we were sitting as a council to potentially lower the height uh, and push push what heights left towards the highway, and then and then have fewer stories on the on the east side if there is only one phase. But that's all to be determined. Is but I just I want to make sure because again in terms of accuracy and what we're submitting to a state mm -hmm. agency, we are saying 89 units on 2.59 acres. That is what we're saying we're going to do. That is the basic parameter. All right, so let me so, let me turn back to Commissioner Pierce and see if we can, yeah, those, those are good points. Um, if we leave the language as is, as recommended by staff, understanding that the developer must still receive site plan approval from the United City Council, uh, but we know this is this sort of proven language is, is acceptable to Minnesota Housing Finance, does that create more comfort for you? Um, I, so the, the Follow-up question I would have, which is similar to earlier, I think that's a question for the developer. And so I don't know if their project financing is based on two phases or not. And so now if we're saying there can't be a phase two because it 
addresses some of our other issues, is it a viable project in their eyes? And then frankly, I, like, then I get confused altogether because this is asking us to support financing, but we still end up talking about, well, is it too, what's the right setback? We, we start talking mm -hmm. about all these land use challenges, which I don't think are appropriate for HRA. So I, so I get a little, uh, I'm, I'm still challenged process-wise with that. And you, so. Okay, in, in, in my mind, what I'm thinking is we as a body are being asked to approve this resolution. The staff report that accompanied this resolution has a very specific number of units on the site. And this is, you know, going to be part of a state grant application. So this is, this is the specific. And so I just I want everybody to be clear on that because we can't be submitting a grant saying we're going to have 89 units on 2.59 acres and then oh oops by the way we're actually not going to do that we're going to have more I mean we we need to have consistency and it okay it is a big deal because it is the state of Minnesota it's a grant and we need to be accurate this we need to be providing accurate data. And so that's that's why I am concerned. And yes, your point about setbacks and all of that, that's true. That's uh, not really appropriate for that, but but it is really critical at this stage of financing that we all know what we're talking about. And to me, this says there is no phase two. So Can this is one of those situations where you, you have to remember which hat you have on. Sure. So we're the, sitting as the economic development arm of the city here, and we're saying in this whereas clause at the bottom of page one that we understand that the city council is still gonna to have to approve this from a site plan basis, and those are all issues to, for us to address as the council. So sitting as the economic development entity of the city, do we support this resolution? And that's, to me, what we're talking about. And I didn't mean to interrupt. Commissioner Agnew had some, some uh, contribution to the conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the resolution in front of us doesn't stipulate 2.59 acres. Um, and so if you review the resolution, it doesn't restrict it to only phase one. What it says is um, there's this site um, and that it consists of, I mean, right now it says approximately the 89 affordable rental units, but it doesn't say that it's restricted to that. And so I'm just saying that like, Right now, as the HRA, we're reviewing this document, and this document does not restrict it to one phase. True. However, it's informed by the staff report. And I just want to be sure that, you know, and, and part of this is feeling like, you know, we've talked about process. This is a really challenging thing to do. People have to jump through hoops, thread the needle. And I just, I want to be clear that we are being transparent. Um, and this is what the public saw when you know they were looking at the packet and i don't want to be like jumping to a different project after supporting this resolution so i hear you it's not in there but it is informed by this staff report one thing that you pointed out commissioner Agno, that is inherent in this resolution is that the 80, as I recall, when we did sketch plan as a council, the 89 affordable units is only phase one. So we're not saying anything about phase two, to your point. This only deals with phase one and the cost of the project for phase one. Commissioner Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think of this as, and forgive my use of this, putting an ante to play the game. That we are, I would talk to a member of the um, Edina Housing Foundation, and they told me, this is so that we can have the next conversation. And this is the parameters of what's going to be submitted to the state of Minnesota. They're not going to look at the staff report. They're only going to look at this resolution and what we send them. Um, that's going to go into the application. All the conversations, if we don't do this, the conversation stops. And this moves the conversation forward. The project can change. There'll be you know, limits on what the funding is, just like any deal where the, the 
lenders are going to say, well, this much money for this, in this case, it's going to be grantors are going to say, we'll give this much money for this project. And if it changes, you have to go back and you have to amend it and things like that, just like any other deal. But this is just to get the, the ball rolling here, to, 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 to start the conversation. Um, and if it changes, then we'll have to go back and, and there is grant money from the state, well, then we'll have to you know have that conversation then. But uh, for now, this is what the application is going to be to the state of Minnesota. And so I think we need to keep that specificity in there. Sitting as the Economic Development Authority of the city, um, I'm cognizant of what Manager Hawkinson is saying about we need a little bit more definitive language so the language I proposed wasn't acceptable to her and she didn't think it would help at Minnesota Housing Finance and they've given guidance on don't, don't use words that are, are hedging in nature even though we know that uh, we can't, you know, we're going to at some point in time look at land use from a city council standpoint and they, and they recognize that too. So it causes me to think that we should go with the recommendation of the of our manager, but I do want to have further conversation about what Commissioner Jackson is suggesting, and and I sensitive to Commissioner Pierce's comment and, and think it was a good one. Let's not get, let's not create complication here. We we as Manager Hawkins and pointed out, we don't have any uh, adopted policy around the building dignity and respect code of conduct. And I think it's a wonderful thing to talk about and think about. Uh, and let's also remember the intended purpose of this resolution is to say that the Economic Development Authority of the city of, Minia of, city of Edina says that we'll, we'll consider giving this developer up to $2.5 million in assistance to create an affordable housing, housing project that's 89 units of rental property. If the city council says, yeah, it's okay from a land use standpoint, that's what I think we should concentrate on is the intended purpose of the resolution and not try to overburden it with other things that we haven't even decided on from a policy standpoint yet, though they may be entirely laudable. Other, other thoughts? I, I would just add that, you know, I believe in safe conditions and fair wages, right? Hard stop. And I don't, I don't think that that's what we're talking about here, right? I think we're thinking about how do we then attach something to this potential project that helps enforce that. And I don't know what the right way to do that is. Um, this might be the right way. This might not be. Um, I do agree it hasn't been tested. And in, in general, I'm willing to test things out, right? Yeah. So. Put it in there, learn from it, iterate, and then as a city we can determine, is this something that should go in down the road? And yet, I think that there will be future opportunities as we continue the process with this project and probably as city council members on the approval of it, where it might fit better and to Commissioner Pierce's point, not take away from the intent of this resolution. Right. Uh, that's a great point. I, was, I had that down in my notes here. That I think the proper place for this is if it was ever approved in whatever form it is approved in, it's the development agreement that is the key legal document where you bind somebody. On, and they're going to be bound by prevailing wage anyway. But it's in the development agreement, it seems to me, that you create this kind of language. Uh, and I think it's nice for Minnesota Housing Finance to potentially see this, but I'm sensitive to what our manager says about be careful about how we word this thing. Commissioner Jackson. Well, I would say given what the, has happened in the legislature in the last year, um, there's been great enhancement of worker protections in state law. It's been signed by this governor. This is his MHFA. I think this would actually increase the odds of this going through MFHA, that they'd be excited to see this. Um, and I just want to put that out there. No, it's a good thought, too. Well, I, to, to the point you're just making, it seems to me that you could have that language that you've proposed in the whereas clause, but delete it from the, from the uh, resolution itself and let the development agreement dictate that because you've indicated uh, in the whereas clause that the um, developer has agreed to sign such an agreement and then we can enforce it within the 
Because we're not going to be doing the development agreement as the HRA. I don't think it's going to be as the city council. Right. So, so you, this language doesn't even really pertain to us as an HRA that's in the resolution. You could give us that direction as a, as a group to incorporate it at that location too. Manager Hawkinson, what um, do you think about the idea of keeping it in a whereas clause, but ro 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 eliminate it from the resolution? Eliminate it from the resol this resolution? Excuse me? Eliminate it from the end there. Be, there be, therefore, be it resolved that it's not down in there because it's an inappropriate, pla inappropriate place for it because the HRA isn't going to be the entity signing the development contract, right. development agreement. That, but you could still have it up in the whereas clause that indicates and signals to the Minnesota Housing Finance that we understand that the developer has agreed to participate in the Building Dignity and Respect Program. So you leave that language in up in the second whereas clause on page two, but you you change the language on the last, uh, the second to the last, be it, there, therefore be it resolved to eliminate it down there. I don't know if Commissioner Jackson would agree to that or not, but at least that's one idea. Chair, commissioners, um, I believe that I have not read the agreement, um, and so I don't know what it says. Minnesota Housing, this resolution really is to show city support and not have any other things attached to it. They will judge the application, and I would like to be clear, it's a loan, not a grant, um, from Minnesota Housing. They will judge the application based on what the developer indicates in multiple documents that they need to submit and not based on this resolution. Um, I think we do have a policy about fair labor standards and other things, I, and it seems like we should um, really vet what that letter says compared to existing policies that we already have regarding fair labor standards um, and not commit at this juncture and this time with something that has not been this letter in agreement that has not been reviewed thoroughly. But I don't know if our attorney has reviewed it and I, I have not reviewed it. Mr. Kendall, any comment? Uh, I have reviewed the document briefly, Mr. Chair. D do you have any questions about it? <laughs> I think Manager Hawkinson had an inquiry for you. Well, I would defer to Manager Hawkinson on how that would impact MHFA's grading of the application. I don't know how it would impact that. Okay. And is it accurate that we do not have an adopted policy around this issue? Manager Neal? Yeah, we do not. Right. And then if, uh, back if to I Manager could, Hawkinson on the second page you, of your document, not the... Not, uh, Commissioner Jackson's. Around aspects of it, Bill? Uh, correct. In uh, late 2022, we updated the city's tax increment financing policy. And paragraph 11 of that policy did address this issue in general terms. Okay. So it did not reference this particular document or, or guide. Um, but paragraph 11 is what Ms. Hawkinson had just mentioned, um, uh, the, that there are provisions that would be defined and clarified in, in a future funding agreement, um, not in a resolution, but in the actual agreement. Uh, of course, staff would recommend that we follow our policy. Um, if there are better documents or, or more concise documents, we might want to update our policy in the future. But right now we do have general guidance to go in this direction already. Okay. So that's a paragraph and this policy is like three or four pages, I think, of, of material, right? Correct. It's very, the breadth of it is quite wide. Okay. Um, Manager Hawkinson, on the page two of the uh, resolution that you prepared for council, you had the, the, the word potential was underlined and you said, no, that's a no, no. That was my idea. So strike, strike as we think about what the former resolution might be that we pass, you're suggesting strike through the word potential uh, use the word will, not may, in that first whereas clause on page two. 
And then you're recommending uh, deleting that next whereas clause where it references the um, uh, the supposed agreement between the developer uh, or the de agreement of the developer to enforce the terms of the building dignity and respect code of conduct. You're suggesting that be eliminated for purposes of sending a resolution to the Minnesota Housing Finance Authority. Right, yes, and then have us um, really look at that letter and agreement and see how we can incorporate that um, into a final development agreement, um, if not as a standalone document. So it, it just buy us time to explore it. Okay, and then in that first be it resolved clause, um, are you suggesting that the, the word shall go back in there? Shall provide? Yes. The way you originally had it? So get rid of may potentially and have it read shall provide? Correct. And then is the language and amount not to exceed okay? I believe that will be okay. Um, yes. And then underscored is with final approval by the Atlanta City Council. That's, that's okay too, I think. Correct. Okay. Mr. Chair, I do have one comment. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if this language is coming out of the resolution, but it says here that the developer has agreed to sign this agreement for the Building Dignity and Respect Program. I'm not aware, and maybe other staff is, uh, whether they have agreed to do that. I did read the document. It's about a 10-page document. It has a lot of requirements. I don't know if the developer has agreed or would agree to sign that document. Uh, when you're talking about providing finance as the HRA, I think it's possible to add a condition like that, although I don't know how that would impact their application to the MHFA. When you're talking about acting as the city council, uh, if it's straight zoning and their application complies with zoning, uh, there's not a lot of discretion to add conditions or to deny it. If you're looking at doing a PUD, there probably is some more discretion, and it might be possible to put this in as a condition of the PUD, but uh, I don't think the HRA or the council should assume that it will be necessarily, that the developer will agree to this or that it will be easy to place this into the development contract as a requirement unless you do that as part of a PUD and the developer agrees to that. Member Risser. Could it be part Risser. of the financing deal? Depending on how the financing is done, I think it could be. I mean, it's not clear to me if the financing is going to be TIF or business subsidy or something else. The housing trust. Yeah. Housing trust. So it depends on how that financing would occur it might be possible to make it a condition of that financing. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Commissioner Jackson. Um, thank you. I would like to ask that we uh, make the changes with two different motions so that we can um, separate out the um, uh, conditional language from the issue of the um, uh, building dignity and respect code of conduct. <laughs> All right, let me get a, some clarification from you on that. What you're, could you tell us in a little bit more detail what you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. So we've got this uh, resolution 2023-05 in front of us. We're talking about making some amendments to what was published in the public notice of this meeting. There in the, looking at page two in the first whereas clause, I see two changes. And then in the uh, be it further resolved clause, also making a change. And I would move that as one amendment to this resolution. And then as the second amendment to vote on the second whereas clause of page two, whereas the developer builder has agreed as a condition um, about the building dignity and respect to code of conduct. So rather than making it um, just one motion to, to amend the document, to make it two motions uh, amending the document. Uh, what about the um, language you proposed in that last, in the resolution portion of the, that would be part of the second potential amendment? Then? Right, so, um, so yeah, we would, um, the second amendment would be um, t 
that's that's a good point to um, adopt or amend the uh, the well. We'd have to. That'd be three motions then. So I haven't moved the the proposed well, language that I brought. Yeah, with no, we me. haven't moved anything yet. Right. So, so what we're working off of is this resolution right here. So we could take that up as a motion, and then we could either amend the language to be what I brought with me, or we could vote it straight up or down. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna read what I think is a potential resolution that could pass. I'm going to hand it to Manager Hawkinson to look at it. First of all, I think in the third, uh, Manager Hawkinson, on page one, uh, you got to be at resolved language. And whereas, whereas, I think if we leave that language in there about the 89 affordable rental apartment units for individuals with families uh, and families with an average household income at or below 50% median income, we should define that as the project. So I'd interlineate oh, yeah. there the word capital P project because we use the word project at the end of the resolution. And then on, um, so this is for all my colleagues as well. And then on the top of page two, that's the only change I see on page one. Um, and then on page two, it would read, whereas this financing is a local contribution, strike the word potential and will, uh, not may, will assist the developer. That's the only change there. Delete the next whereas clause, which references the building dignity and respect code of conduct. And then uh, the next one is clean. And then the, uh, that's the first be it resolved provision. And then the next be it resolved paragraph, uh, where it says shall may at the end of the first line, that should be shall. Strike the word may. Strike the words uh, potentially provide on the second line. Or so it reads, shall provide. Uh, and then the rest of that language is okay. And then at the last be it resolved paragraph, you would delete the word development because we used the word project in there and that relates back to defining the project at the beginning of the resolution in the third or the second whereas clause. Is that, does the people want to look at this or does everybody follow along? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I think it, we, we've come to in discussion and then we can take up Commissioner Jackson's notion on, the, on a potential second amendment. Okay. Um, and that's a good way to handle it. Okay, so uh, with those modifications to the um, a proposed HRA resolution 2023-05, is there a motion to adopt the resolution as modified? So moved. Commissioner Agnew moves. Second. Commissioner uh, Risser seconds the adoption of HRA Resolution 2023-05 as modified. Um, any further discussion? All those, uh, Commissioner Pierce. Just, um, I just wanted to make uh, one point. So in, I, I am really challenged with this process and I'm, you know, I am unable to kind of unravel the challenge that I have. Um, the, I asked questions in council and at HRA of the developer, and they were very clear that um, the metrics that go into their building in terms of density uh, yields a, a structure of this size. And so if it was fewer stories, they can't get the density, so they couldn't get the funding. So I believe that by us um, approving this resolution, we are in fact um, saying that the, the project, the 89 affordable rental apartment project, um, project at that address, that we're supporting that. And so you may not agree with me in that, but that's how it feels to me. Um, and so, um, I don't, I, I don't think the developer is going to come back in, in, at council and say, yep, we're going to do two stories because it fits better in the neighborhood. They're, they're not going to be able to do that. And so I think they're going to come back with the project that they have. They may adjust the uh, setbacks here or there, um, but I think it's going to be this, the project that we saw at sketch review um, and so I can't I can't um, 
I, I can't get comfortable with this notion of approving uh, this, this bit of financing for a project that I just don't know that it's the right project. And I, I get it, the sequence could be different. And if the sequence were different, we would have had several conversations with the developer and the, at this stage, there'd be a different project sitting in front of us. Um, personally, I tried to address that. I came to the um, planning commission meeting um, to, so I've had that presentation several times, uh, but I just can't personally get around that. So I just wanted to make that, that uh, those statements for the record. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in every way awkward. Um, and as we sit, even as an economic development entity, and we say, yeah, we could uh, live with this idea, uh, it's still subject to us sitting again as the Adina City Council. Right. And, um, uh, but I think, you know, to the point you raised, uh, and it's, they're, they're good ones, they're always good ones. Uh, Manager Hawkinson, so if, if the council said, uh, no, we're, uh, we're not going to approve 89 units, we're going to approve 55 units, and, you know, and, and it's still economically viable, uh, how does that affect what they do over at Minnesota Housing Finance? Um, Chair, council members, I try to address that a little bit in the staff report, um, where I state that as long as the proportion of four bedrooms, three bedrooms, one bedroom stays the same, so if 5% are four bedroom units, even if the building shrinks in size, that is allowed by Minnesota Housing. They do understand that these are early stages, so that is allowed. It could not change from rental to ownership, but it could change in size and massing. As long as it remains financially viable um, under the, the awards that are the financial awards um, from the different funding entities. Mm -hmm. But um, it's like what we've had in other developments in the past where between sketch plan and permit, changes happen, tweaks happen, um, it, and this is even an earlier stage. So yes, that would be allowed. Okay. So, and, and or if they uh, kept that same level of uh, potential occupancy in terms of number of units, but it's no longer five stories, it's four stories on the highway and three stories to the east. I mean, any of those configurations still create viability at the, at the uh, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. But yes. at, at the point you made earlier, I think is your, your, your notion is we gotta start somewhere. Yes. And the, as sitting as the HRA, we're prepared to say, okay, we'll, we'll help out here if the city council decides on a project that they can approve and a, the developer can live with it. But we do think from a conceptual standpoint, this is a good place for affordable housing. But we've got a long way to go. Yeah, awkward. yeah, both commissioners, Commissioner Jackson, Commissioner Risser. So I just wanna make it perfectly clear to everybody in the room here, this gives us the opportunity to have a public hearing. I absolutely do not want this to go away without having a public hearing and so, I think that's that's the, my overriding emotion in this is I want everybody to hear from everybody else. And so um, I'll be supporting this because I really want to have that public hearing. And there'll probably be three, one at the Planning Commission, one at City Council, and then if there's TIF financing, we'll have another public hearing. So I really want everybody to have a voice in this. If we vote no now, we shut off that process. And I really want to hear from people. So right. thank you. Commissioner Risser. Um, I really want to thank Commissioner Pierce for saying what he said, and I feel very much the same way. And what I've been messaging has been primarily about the credibility um, we would have with the granting agency. But, um, you know, I, I feel as if I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop, that I don't know everything. And this has been a very frustrating process for me. Uh, I've gone back, I've watched the planning commission hearing where it, there was really no phase two that was emphasized. It might, you know, it was, this is going to be this range. And, but there was more focus on the building. And um, then it comes to us and it's this traditional style sketch plan that I think all of us are familiar with, with the 
um, way a sketch plan is considered to function and the whole idea like this is this is all about hearing from you we want to hear what you have to think you know what you think and all of that and that is what I am used to when I think about a sketch plan and then less than 48 hours later I realized it wasn't that at all it it was the sketch plan that wasn't you know it it was a very specific ask for a very specific project and I feel like the way our process is working, um, I know a lot of people are feeling frustrated. I feel frustrated, and I I really do feel like you know I know it's hard. I know it's you know you thread the needle. You have to figure out how to do this. But I I feel like it is so weird that the messaging in front of council was so different than um, what came out in here to HRA. So. I'm aware of that, um, but I, I also really feel like the whole purpose of a sketch plan, you know, is to save the developer money and um, to get feedback, to have that community input and all of that. And here in the context of what we're talking about, it's, it's not just the developer, it's all the staff, it's all the community, it's granting agencies. And so we have had a sketch plan that has not generated the kind of useful information and I, I really you know I don't want to see this happen again. Commissioner Agno. Thank you Chair. Thank you Commissioner Risser. This is weird right to have gone through the sketch plan process and then two days later to be discussing potential financing right it, it is weird right I completely agree with that. Um, but I don't think that it's weird because of the developer. I don't think it's weird because of the city of Edina or something that we're doing wrong. I think it's because the housing system in this country is broken. And I, I brought a book today because I think that this is a really good one. It's called Fixer Upper, How to Repair America's Broken Housing Systems. We have broken systems and there are additional difficulties and hoops to jump through for affordable housing in particular. And we as a country already are 6.5 million units short of housing, and we're not making it easy to add any additional housing. And so it's, it's weird, and I think that we should evolve and fix the process in as much capacity as we can in the city of Edina as both city council members and HRA members. But right now, I want to see this project go to the next phase. And by that, I mean have the public hearings, have the discussions about it. This isn't me saying I am absolutely committing to the $2.5 million no matter what. It's saying I believe that our city, our state, and our country needs more affordable housing, and I want to progress towards evaluating this project on this site and potentially supporting it as a city. No, well said. Commissioner Risser, go ahead. Uh, it is going to be really hard if the financing package is TIF. You know, and I just, I want to put that out there because of the way, and, and I know we have to put our, you know, in our different roles, but I just, I just want to say that, you know, to the points that have been made already. Um, and I, I really do think trust, trust is so important, you know, and as elected officials, we need to be able to trust. A community needs to be able to trust. And I'm going to stop at that. Mr. Jackson, anything? I am so pleased to serve with this panel. A lot of really good brains here and a lot of good discussion. Um, but yes, our housing system is severely broken. And that's why we're having this very strange conversation. But yeah, I want, I want that public hearing. I want it bad. So <laughs> I'm going to vote yes. I've got a hundred questions rolling through my head ever since we had sketch plan about this uh, project. And uh, some of them involve uh, land use, some of them involve the proposed structure of the deal, the different capital stacks, the developer fee, the, our investment, what's our return on investment, uh, use, of, use of PUD, where's the give to get? You know, all, there's, a, there's a multitude of questions that we need answers to when we sit as a city council that may result in approval of a uh, project in some form. It may result in a rejection of the whole notion of this project at that location. 
but we've got a long way to go, and um, I think Commissioner Agnew said it well. Let's take that. Let's take that first baby step as the HRA and say, yeah, if if the city council ends up uh, approving something here uh, that they can get financed, then uh, we'll, um, we'll 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 back it up with some help in in some form that we always we also have to agree on it to city council. So I'm prepared to take a look at it uh, in a little bit more detail here to see if it makes any sense. But uh, so far, we're, we're not at that point of making that kind of a decision. So, all right. Um, this is another great conversation, I would say, based on, you know, just a continuation of the one we had last Thursday with, a, with good thinking going on and, and patience in our community on both sides of this issue. Thank you for the respect that you've given us uh, and, your, and each other, because um, we've had plenty of uh, matters in this chambers where we've had people lined up on different sides on both on issues and testifying pro con pro con and everybody in Edina has always treat, treated each other with a great deal of civility so let's uh, let's take it to the next step let's see what the developer comes up with and and then we'll evaluate it at the council level um, so uh, we have a motion and a second and um, any further discussion all those in favor of uh, adoption of HRA Resolution 2020? No, no, this is the amendment. We had a motion to amend the resolution. No, I'm, I'm going to ask for approval in its modified form. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to, uh, we had a motion, yeah, we already got a motion to adopt the HRA Resolution 2023-05 in its modified form. We okay. got a second. So now we just need to vote. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of HRA Resolution 2023-05 in its modified form as, as read, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. It passes. I'm, and I'm abstaining. abstaining. You're abstaining? It's just, this is so hard. I feel like, I don't feel like I've been given clear information when I've needed it. And I do kind of feel like, you know, we talk about this and... The, the games we play came up, you know, the, or the, the game, this is the way the game is played. And I honestly, at the end of this process, I feel played and I don't know what to do. So you're abstaining? Yeah. Or, or, all right, the motion passes um, in the form uh, approved, the form read. Um, all right, I think that's, now we gotta go back to Commissioner Jackson's idea of thinking about an amendment here or a resolution. I think maybe just take it in the form of a resolution, uh, you know, the, in conjunction with this particular matter, or you can take it in whatever form you want. If you wanna, uh, see, let's look at the language of it and see what it would be. I think it'd be easy as an amendment. Best. But we passed the resolution, so we can't yeah. amend it now. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so that, okay, that's, um, yeah, I think you're right. So now we're going to entertain a motion to amend the resolution we just passed uh, with the language that uh, Commissioner Jackson has proposed. Uh, it would be interlineating a um, whereas provision in page two. And then there would be a change in the, the last whereas or the re resolution clause on page two, the second to the last resolution clause. Remember, Commissioner Jackson, I'll let you speak to it and so, then move it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know this is a new program, but this is a serious problem and it has to begin somewhere. This is a program that's been worked out in other states and been proven to be effective. I really think that we want to be upfront and from the very beginning that this is an expectation that we want affordable housing to be built in a completely uh, legal and protective way. Before we didn't have any tools. I've been, like I said, I've been looking at this for over two years now. And I work with a group called City Leaders Against Wage Theft. And we've been researching and trying to figure out some tools, and now we have one. I believe this has been carefully researched. I uh, think that it's been looked at um, by people who are in the business and understand how prevailing wage works and where it falls short and what can be done. The terms of the agreement will be worked out um, in the process. So we're not ag agreeing to a specific um, 
wording, we're not agreeing to a specific agreement, but that we want to, as a city, ensure that when we build affordable housing in this city, it is done so in a way that protects our uh, marginalized workers. And so I will move the changes that I uh, proposed. Uh, so it's a new whereas clause, whereas the developer builder has agreed as a condition of city financial support to sign an agreement to participate in the building Maybe what we do, rather than having the developers agree, that as a condition, just take, whereas as a condition of city financial support, the developer will sign an agreement to participate in the Building Dignity and Respect Program and enforce the terms of the Building Dignity and Respect Code of Conduct for the project. And then in the second resolution um, clause, to add final approval will be granted only if the developer slash builder has signed an agreement to participate in the Building Dignity and Respect Program and to enforce the terms of the Building Dignity and Respect Code of Conduct for the project. Okay, I think I've got that down. Um, so to go further, we need a second on that motion. I'll, I'll second. All right, we're seconding the, uh, the adoption of the amendment for discussion purposes. Uh, and now, now discussion. So, uh, Commissioner Jackson has set forth her thoughts on it. Um, others? Commissioner Reagan? I'll reiterate what I had said before. I've I want us to figure out a way to incorporate this into this project specifically. I don't think that this resolution or this document is necessary, necessarily where it needs to happen. Um, so, I, I mean, I'd love to hear what others think, but I would be fine not including it at this stage as long as we come back to it. Commissioner Pierce. Um, I, so I actually agree with Commissioner Agnew, um, but th where I'm challenged with this is the, it, to me it comes to the question of resolution versus policy, right? Does this need to be someplace more substantive than being attached to just this project? Um, is the, the thought that I, that I have. And if we think it should be, then um, I don't think this will be the right place to attach it. However, I do understand Commissioner Jackson saying we want to hold this developer to that standard now uh, before we have, have substantiated it from a policy perspective. Commissioner Risser. I agree with what commissioners Agnew and Pierce have said, I also am very grateful for Commissioner Jackson for bringing this up. Um, I think it is worth pursuing perhaps when we get to financing, if we get to financing. And um, also it could make sense to, I don't know if it would make sense to send it to the, the Human Rights Commission and see how we could get it into policy more broadly. Uh, I concur with my colleagues. I, I, I think one of the problems for me is that implicit in the adoption of the language of the amendment uh, to me is uh, uh, an implied adoption of a policy we have never approved. And that's it. What I hear is a 10 page document that we haven't even discussed. And so I'm not, I'm not prepared to do that. I, should we have a more specific policy than one paragraph that we discussed here with our uh, economic development manager. Uh, I'm all, uh, I'm all uh, uh, in favor of having that conversation and adopting that kind of a policy that protects the dignity and respect of workers that work on projects in our community. But I'm not prepared to support an uh, amendment that implies that we're supporting a policy that we've not approved. So, um, those in favor of adoption of the amendment, does that conclude the discussion? Those in favor of adoption of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 Uh, amendment fails. Okay. Thanks for a good Thank discussion. You. Thanks, yeah, good discussion. And bringing something to the forefront that we all want to address. Um, okay. 
Executive Director, any comments? Uh, nothing for tonight. HRA commissioners, any comments? Okay. Tough meeting, good meeting. Thanks, everybody. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. Got a motion by Commissioner Jackson, second by Commissioner Agnew to adjourn the meeting of the HRA this Thursday, June 15th, 2023. All those in favor of, adjour of adjournment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. We stand adjourned.